you do write a bucket list, you're not writing it for the version of you now, you're writing it for the version that you could, of the person you could become. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. We've got a great show for you today. Our interview today is with Chase from Bucket List Lifestyles. Chase has made it his mission to do some of the coolest adventures and experiences in the world. And Chase gives us some great insights into some practical ways that you can achieve your dreams, bucket list items in, in his case. And he has an amazing story that I'm anxious to share with you. He's got some profound insights that I believe will help you to put on a piece of paper your dreams, your desires, and think about how you can actually achieve these in your lifetime. So we're not just going to be dreaming because dreaming is just a fantasy. We're going to figure out how we can make our bucket list dreams a reality. So here's my interview with Chase. Okay, if you could start by just introducing yourself and perhaps telling us your age. Yeah, I'm Chase Beringer, and I'm 28 years old. Great, great. And what's your backstory? I know that you're obsessed with bucket lists. Tell us a little bit about how all that came about. Well, it's actually kind of uh, an interesting story because I wrote the bucket list when it was the darkest period of my life. I I had been chasing a version of success for my entire life. Um, I grew up in a very, very small town of 300 people uh, in the Oregon woods. And my version of success was to get married, to, to buy the house, the three-bedroom, two-bath house, and have the wife and the kids. And, and I, I chased that, and I got that very young. I, I had my house and the wife and the dogs and the, and the cars at 19 years old, and it all came crashing down at 22. Uh, she had an affair with one of my good friends, and it was devastating to me. It dropped me into a very deep depression, and it was... Yeah, no doubt, the the darkest period of my life. And and I needed an escape from the reality that I was living in. I needed a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's where the bucket list actually came in. I used the bucket list, writing the bucket list, as a light at the end of the tunnel to see that there, like I had this idea that this is what life could be like for, for someone else who wasn't in my situation, who wasn't living my life. Almost like a doppelganger. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Someone else. Do you have any idea of what the inspiration was a bucket list out of all the different ways that you could try to find the light at the end of the tunnel? What was that about bucket list that appealed to you so much? I was actually watching TV. There was a show on, on MTV and it, and it was about some guys with a bucket list from Canada called The Buried Life. And they had been uh, traveling around together as a group of friends crossing off their bucket list items. And it was it was pretty simple because it wasn't a show that I'd ever seen before. It wasn't a show that I was watching all the time, but it just happened to be on the TV, and and I was like, "Huh, there like that seems fun." Like it, it just seemed like a, they were just having so much fun doing it, and I hadn't had fun in a long time. I had just been kind of like numb to life. So in in just seeing how much like life they had, I think that's what kind of drew me towards that. Cool. So would you say that's one of the main reasons to have a bucket list or why should people consider doing one? Oh, well, that's a, I would definitely say that's not the the main reason is, hey, if your life is, you know, super dark right now, then you should write a bucket list. A bucket list is so much more than just an escape. If you want to actually achieve the dreams that you have, or you want more clarity on the path that you'd like to take in your life, I'd say 100% write a bucket list. And that's not just to talk about dreams. It's to actually turn them into reality. It's it's to claim them powerfully by writing them down, to make a plan, and then to actually take the leap and do it. And is the bucket, is it something that you just, you did it over a course of a couple of days. Is it something that you just, you have a list, you keep adding to it? or, uh, Or how do you do the plans? Or walk us through exactly how you started executing your list. Absolutely. So the first thing is the way that I personally wrote my list is not necessarily how, you know, it's not the the way, you know, like the the end all be all, this is the exact way you need to do it. However, I found that it was really helpful for me in my process, which is I decided that it was going to be a hundred things to to keep it 
simple for myself and just to say, okay, I have a hundred things, a hundred things to complete. And as I was writing it, I kept it pretty simple in, I, I was Googling a lot of different other people's stuff because in my mind, I had never really thought outside the box as to what life could be. I had never met anyone who's been outside of the country before. I had never met anyone who's owned a business or done anything wild before. So in trying to create that possibility for myself and trying to think, what do I want to do with my life? It was really challenging for me to figure out like, okay, like what should I do or what do I want to do? As opposed to just looking at like, what other people were writing on theirs. And I started going like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Because I probably wrote about 20 of them myself. And then that's when I was like, uh, okay, I can't really think of anything else. And having a number, having 100 items for me was just, it made it more simple and more tangible for me because I really like checking off my to-do list. I really like the feeling of accomplishment when I go, okay, I got that thing done. And although... I have like a little bit of a secret list that I keep on my notes and my iPhone. I still have that original list. And and now I've crossed off 80 of them, 80 of the 100 over the last six years. And it's been a beautiful, beautiful journey. It's great. I'm looking forward to talking more about that as we get a little further. So when you have your list now, it's still 100. It's kind of overwhelming. Do you categorize them or do you put them in the easy or the hard? Or what do you, what's next? Yeah, so... I have categorized them, but it's definitely not something that anybody needs to do. Like I use it as as my hobby. And sometimes when I'm bored, I'll be like, okay, here's the travel ones. Here's the family ones. Here's the really expensive ones or the ones that I have to do later in life. Uh, What I would say is if you look at your life right now in what you are currently capable of, uh, and what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, you write on your bucket list, I want to go to space well, I'm sorry, but in this exact moment, you very likely cannot just do it this weekend. So by actually figuring out, okay, what is pretty easy for me to get done, both financially and like time-wise and what you're capable of with taking time off work or whatever you need, figuring out what the easy ones are, I would definitely say getting clear on that is important. One thing that I forgot to mention, and it's really, really important when it comes to actually writing the list, is understanding that you're not writing the list for you right now. That's so, so important is right now, if you were to write the list of, okay, what's possible? Okay, well, I have, you know, I have young children, so I can't travel. I have, you know, um, some credit card debt or I don't have any savings. So, okay, let's, you know, if you're writing your list for what you're currently capable of doing in this exact moment, the list is going to be nowhere near what your true desires are. I would definitely ask that anyone writing it would open up possibility, not only financially or their current life situation, because this truly is a list for your entire life, not just for the next couple of years. It's a really, really cool thing to just say, if money wasn't a problem, if time wasn't a problem, what would I actually do? And then actually claiming that by writing that down and just saying, okay, if if money wasn't a problem, because it may not be a problem in the future, this is exactly how I would live my life. Then let's say, let's use money as the example, because it's usually money or time, but money is something tangible that people can say, okay, let's say they want to go to some place that's going to cost $10,000, but they've got $20,000 in credit card debt. So that's not in the realm. Do you need to then come up with a plan? You just can't wish it, make it happen. Something's got to, you've got to take some tangible steps in order to start achieving some of these dreams and goals. A hundred percent. So first of all, uh, just to give people a little bit of context, I was a caregiver when I wrote that bucket list. And when I was starting to live the bucket list lifestyle, what I, what I started blogging about and things like that, because I didn't have a lot of money and I was traveling around the world doing a lot of crazy stuff. And, and the way that I was able to do these things was I, I got a taste for life. I got a taste for crossing off these items and I started researching how can I do this for incredibly cheap? How, like, how can I get resourceful and actually make it happen? So personally for me in my life, I decided to get really resourceful and I learned how to travel hack using credit card sign up bonus miles. And, and, uh, there's a lot of ways and you can go onto the, any travel blog for the most part, or my travel blog and learn more about like how to actually do it cheap. But really if, if it's not 
something that you're currently capable of. Let's say you are in 20K in in credit card debt and it is something that it's in Europe, for example, which is a little bit more expensive. It's okay that this is not the time for you to cross that item off. There are plenty of things to do that are exciting and fun that don't cost that much money. And I'm not the kind of person that just says like, ah, just whatever, just do it anyways and go live your life. You know, it's just money because that's not, that's not the world that we live in. You need money to, to get by and survive. And, and so I am very practical when it comes to you. It's okay to push those a bit off into the the near future and to tackle the things that you want to do in this life that are reasonable. Uh, There was plenty of items that were absolutely free for me on my list, like getting to know my grandpa better, openly talking to my father, giving my mother a a dozen roses and telling her that I love her not on Mother's Day. Uh, There's there's so many things, and especially the things that I thought were expensive, but weren't actually that expensive, like flying an airplane. I found it on Groupon for $60. You know, there and, and that, that comes from the planning process of saying, all right, how much does this actually cost and how long would it take for me to save up for it? Right. And I'd like to interject something that's worked very well for me is I'm very good about paying my bills, good credit and all that. So what I did is I've set up travel as a bill. So every month, right out of my checking account, just as if it was my electric bill, it goes into a special savings account that I, I don't touch unless I can't cash flow a particular trip. But it adds up so quickly, you don't even realize it. And if it's a bill and you never see the money in the first place, it doesn't take long for that start to start to stockpile for you. Yeah, I love that. Wow, that's that's a really, really great idea. I've heard of a couple people doing that, but I haven't actually met someone who does that. So it's really, really cool to hear. Now, is it a percentage of your income or is it a specific amount? What I do is it's a certain amount. And then every January, I give myself a raise. Mm. I look at my savings as what I truly earn, because unless you save it, you've got nothing to show for it for the most part. I had to reframe how I thought about savings. So instead of thinking of savings as denying yourself, I now think of it as rewarding myself. And I actually get a dopamine hit, particularly in January when I give myself a raise. So by reframing how I think about savings, I've turned what used to be a drudgery into something I actually look forward to. And so it's it's actually worked really, really well for me. Absolutely. I love it. Now, there's lots of obstacles people face in doing these. Do you have any other tips, whether it's time, money, conquering some fears of doing something, or any other advice you might give them on these kinds of things? Absolutely. So uh, I think a huge one is mindset. So I, I talked earlier about creating possibility and writing this list for the future version of you, someone who you could grow into and become that person who could cross off those items and live that life. But there's there's something to be said for once you plan this, once you figure out, okay, this is how much this will cost, actually pulling the trigger and making that leap is incredibly difficult sometimes, especially, for example, when I when I had never traveled before. And actually taking that leap and and buying a ticket to Spain to run with the bulls, that was my first trip. And and doing that was scary. And I and I did that alone, and that was even more scary for me. So the mindset shift that I would say is really, really helpful if uh if it's not just a financial thing or just one thing, it's just kind of a, a generally a scary thing, is realizing that okay, I have two options. I can either continue on my life path that I'm on right now, I cannot take this leap and go and do this somewhat kind of wild thing, or I can take that path with the wild thing and and I may be successful in it, whatever that means to me, whatever, if that that could be, yes, starting a business, or it could be just going on a trip or having a conversation, and it could go successfully, or I could fail at it. And if I fail at it, I'm just going to come back to exactly where I am now. Let's say if you did take that leap and it didn't go well, you're just going to come back to the same position that you are now, except for you're going to be smarter because you actually learn lessons from it. But you give yourself the opportunity to succeed if you take that path. So one way, you're living your failure by just living the continue, you know, you're living the failure that you're scared of right now. You're living that worst case scenario by walking the path you currently are. Very good. Uh, There's one other thing that uh, has worked for me in that as well. And that was uh, back, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago in January, I already had the winter doldrums and something had bad happened at work and I got really upset. So I was like, 
I'm going to, I was always interested in seeing if I like long-term travel. So I booked a trip for six weeks to Europe, mm. paid for the ticket for, you know, seven, eight months out. And I said, I'll figure out how to do it once that time comes around. And sure enough, I put it on the calendar. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pull this sucker off. But once it was concrete and in the calendar, then I figured out a way to make it happen. So that might be another technique that people could use to kind of get themselves to leap off that diving board. Yeah. And I think it depends on knowing yourself, you know, knowing what type of a person you are. If you're the type that likes to, you know, for example, your your example of saving up every month, just a little bit every month, a little bit every month, and moving towards your goal slowly. Uh, and other people are the type that are like, you know what, I know it's right, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to just like, boom, snap decision and go. So it, knowing yourself, what type of a person you are, because if you put yourself in a situation, let's say you are a saver and a planner, and a long term planner, and you put yourself in a situation where you're like, uh, okay, I just got to decide, I just got to go to Europe, or I just got to go to Carnival in Rio de Janeiro, I got to just go. And that can make you super nervous. And you can actually regret your decision as opposed to okay, I'm the type of person that likes to think things fully through to just save up for them to plan everything out and know that okay, let's take some time on this, not put yourself out of your comfort zone. But don't make this decision from a place that is not your natural way of making your decision, because you may end up just changing your mind if you make it too quick. And then you're like, ah, okay, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. I see from your blog that we've both been to Cooper's Hill. I didn't participate, but I did walk by and did look down the hill. How about telling us a little bit about your experience there? Okay. So, yeah. Listen up for anyone who is currently, uh, you know, half in this. So I would say that my experience that I'm about to tell you about is the most dangerous bucket list item that I've I've ever done, including running with the bulls, including bungee jumping in the Thai jungle, all sorts of wild things that I've done. Cooper's Hill was the most dangerous. Now, there is a absolutely insane festival in England, and it's called Cheese Rolling, the Cheese Rolling Festival. And in a nutshell, there is a bunch of absolutely nutty, out of their minds people at the top of a very, very steep hill. We're talking like almost cliff-like grass hill with tons of potholes in it. And everyone's at the top. Some people are wearing crazy costumes. For myself, I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and some short shorts uh, and some like little orange toe, toe shoes. And as we're at the top, everyone's looking down this big hill and they're getting ready for the cheese rolling. Now, the cheese rolling is where they take a big round of cheese. If you haven't seen a big round of cheese, it almost looks like a wheel made of cheese. And they take it and they roll it down this incredibly steep hill. It's, it's basically a cliff. And they roll it down and all these people sprint down and chase after the cheese. And the first person to either catch the cheese or make it to the bottom of the hill first wins. And at the bottom of the hill, here's what people don't know about cheese rolling that I didn't know about until it was too late, which is at the bottom of the hill, there are men waiting, big men, big, bald, muscular men. They're all rugby players. And these dudes love tackling idiots. <laughs> and I was one of those idiots. And I was standing at the top of the hill talking to the nine-time champion of cheese rolling. And he said, yeah, three years. I haven't done it uh, in two years. And I go, why not? And he goes, well, three years ago, I broke both my legs. And I go, oh my God, how did that happen? And he goes, well, I actually won. I, I, got, I made it to the bottom but the, the danger isn't Cooper's Hill. It's the rugby players at the bottom. One of them picked me up and body slammed me to the ground and broke my legs. And I went, oh my God. But he goes, don't worry. If you don't get tackled by one of the rugby players and you make it past him, there's about 100 meters of sticker bushes, blackberry bushes behind them that you run directly into. <laughs> So it wasn't only the actual cliff, it was at the bottom of the cliff was a whole bunch of danger. And in a nutshell, uh, there was about 300 people up there and they were only running three races with 12 people per race. That's, that's what is that? 36 people out of 300 get to actually run. 
So everyone had traveled around the world to be there. So talk about, I mean, we were throwing elbows and knees and I, I was on my hands and knees crawling between people's legs to try and get to the start line to get to this first race. The first two races go and I'm almost to the front, but I'm not all the way to the front. And someone announces, all right, only local boys this time because a local I hadn't won. So I knew I, I had traveled all the way to England to be in the cheese rolling festival and I wasn't going to get to go. And all the locals line up and there's only 11 of them. There's one spot left. The champion dude who'd, who'd won nine times turns around and he goes, Oi, Hawaiian shirt, get up here. You're an honorary Brockworth boy. Brockworth was the village that we were in. And he pulls me up and I run with the locals and I lose, absolutely lose. But I, and I fall on my butt the entire way down and do cartwheels uh, like everyone else. And a couple guys got really hurt. You know, some dudes broke their arms, their collarbones. I think some people got a lot of dislocated shoulders, but in the end, I made it all the way down to the end, got a photo with the big round of cheese, and I survived, which is the most important part. Very good. Very good. And I have a video that I put on uh, for the Cotswold Wade episode. I'll repost that for this episode as well, because it, it's worth looking at. It's a riot. <laughs> it's insane. It truly is. But how about something a little less insane, but still challenging? You've also been to Nepal, another area that we've car- uh, covered a couple times on this show. I love Nepal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nepal, I actually, that is, it was incredibly challenging for me because I was doing the Everest Base Camp trek. And Nepal is is such a magical place. For those of you who haven't been there, I, I've traveled all over Asia and it is a place where Western culture has hardly touched whatsoever, which is becoming more and more rare. And it is it is so spiritual and, and so grounded and unique. Uh, Kathmandu specifically is a city where if you just get, get lost and you just walk intentionally lost looking for good food or you know maybe a, a good person to talk to, you will have an adventure of some kind. And uh, I, I absolutely love Nepal. I, I've done a lot of trekking in the Himalayas and I, I actually hold the record for the fastest ascent to Everest base camp. And that's why it was so incredibly difficult the first time that I was in uh, in Nepal was to actually trek to Everest base camp. And now I, now I do that every single year, take people with me. So it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful to be in the Himalayas. They're the most beautiful mountains on earth. In my opinion, I've seen a few and uh, it's, it's incredible. It's one of those internal and external challenges where there, there's so much beauty going on outside and there's so much challenge happening inside uh, and at the same time, beautiful because of that challenge and the person that you're becoming as you continue on your path and the trek. Do you have any favorite stories you'd like to share about Nepal? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there I, I was traveling with just me and my Sherpa Shankar. And my Sherpa Shankar, he was probably about four foot 11 and about 90 pounds, maybe soaking wet. And it was just him and I. And we were doing our, our trek for the record. And, it, and we, we got to Gorik Shep, which is, uh, oh, excuse me, we were just below Everest Base Camp, probably by about six or seven hours of trekking. And we were spending the night there. And I got altitude sickness so bad. I mean, we're not talking just like, oh, I got a headache and I felt some nausea. I mean, it, it literally felt as though my spinal cord was being ripped off of my brain. And it it felt as though my my skull was coming apart. And it was the most pain I'd ever been in in my entire life. And my eyeballs were like googly eyes. They were, I couldn't control them. And he stayed by my side the entire night, nonstop, just making sure I try and drink soup and, and made sure that I was okay. And he could hardly speak any English whatsoever. So our communication was just like it with hands and, you know, facial expressions trying to, and he knew what, what I was going through by, you know, for sure. He'd been doing it for 26 years being a Sherpa and he stayed by my side and we, the next day I felt okay to trek. So, so we ended up trekking a long day. It ended up actually being more like nine or 10 hours of trekking to base camp that next day. And, and we made it. And I started asking him on that last day, you know, about himself. You know, I was like, so do you have children? And he said, well, you know, in, in broke, very broken English, but we were able to communicate a bit at that point. He said, I had three kids. And when the earthquake happened, I believe it was 2013. I, I forget exactly when. But um, when the earthquake happened in Nepal, many children were orphaned. There was a lot of kids 
who their parents had passed away. And he had three children of his own living on a farm with him and his wife. And he adopted five more children that were orphaned during the earthquake. And so he had eight children living with him on this farm that he said he loved so much. There were such good kids. And he hardly, you know, he he's a Sherpa in Nepal. They're not making very much money. And when he's not taking people up the mountain, he's farming on his farm 14 hours a day. And I had, you know, asked him about that and and not not a single frown or even he was just so so happy, just smiling ear to ear at the fact that he had these children in his life. And he told me about how during the actual earthquake, how him and the other Sherpas banded together and, and it was uh, more than a hundred Sherpa men would actually trek for miles and miles and miles with these big sticks on their back and they would have buckets of, they would have to go to get fresh water to actually bring water to Kathmandu. The water had, had um, turned off for most of the city. And so they, the Sherpas, they would go and they would get all this fresh water on these big sticks on their back and they would trek hundreds of them all the way out of the city for miles and miles and miles all day. And they'd do that and they'd get back to the city, drop off fresh water, they'd pour it into a big bucket and then they would go back again. And they did that for weeks and they just went back and forth and back and forth. Such incredible, powerful men with the biggest hearts in Nepal, I swear. Yeah, everybody that I've interviewed that's gone to Nepal, just there's something about the soul in Nepal that just appeals to them. They keep wanting to go back and back. And when there's so limited time to see all the places in the world, it's amazing to me how much Nepal just keeps drawing people back multiple times. Uh, absolutely. I, that's why, I mean, I, I don't go just for the Himalayas or, you know, because it's a cool thing to do. I go because every time I get to see Shankar and his family, and I get to experience just, just being lost in Kathmandu is a very interesting feeling. It's a very interesting, kind of feel like you're going into a different realm because there's, you know, there's people that are, have the rickshaws that, and there's, everyone is just dressed still in their traditional garb. It's a very interesting feeling to feel like you're, you're going back in time. Very cool. And for those that are interested, episodes number 17, we did a, a Lodge to Lodge just below Everest Base Camp episode, and then also Annapurna, which is episode number 28. Let's go on to another adventure. Can you talk about something else? Most of our shows are about paddling or hiking or cycling, some other kind of adventure that you may have done or some stories you might want to tell along those lines? Absolutely. So I know that this is, you know, yeah, it's all all about, you know, active, being active and adventuring. And uh, one of my favorite places to to get be outside as much as possible is actually Africa. I was I was recently in Africa a couple months ago, and staying outside, I, I definitely have uh, an active story for you. Something just came in, which was uh, I ended up staying with a tribe called the Hazda tribe in Africa. And they were a tribe that were previously uncontacted, meaning they had never met or spoken to a Western person. And it was, it was life-changing for me, truly. They're the oldest tribe on the planet. 50,000 years this tribe has been together and they're nomadic and they have no possessions. They are a hunter-gatherer tribe. They're not farmers like the Maasai. They take life day by day. And living and hunting with them every day we would get up and hunt for six to 10 hours every single morning, get up and then rest and then hunt again in the evening. And the women would spend their day picking berries and gathering roots. And it was, it was just so interesting that most of their day they are moving and most of their day they are, they're, on the hunt, you know, th- this, uh, this feeling of th- they're all working together. They're making bird noises to communicate. And I'm, I'm sweating, you know, it's Africa. We are, it is hot and we are hunting and we are moving fast because they are just like ghosts. You, you can never hear them and you can, and it's hard to keep up. And, you know, I'm not much of a hunter. I grew up hunting and I stopped hunting once I just started to get a little bit more of a connection with animals but obviously this is kind of a different deal. You know, this is their survival. This is they have babies, they have elderly people in their tribe. They need to they need to hunt to feed their tribe. And so being on a hunt where if you don't get something, you keep hunting. You don't just stop because there's more food in the fridge. You just keep hunting. And it was a very powerful 
experience to realize that these people were absolutely happy, happier than most people that I knew in the West with zero possessions and with needing to find their food and their water every single day. It was a powerful experience to realize there is no such thing as need. You know, they're uh, hardly at least there. You know, people are like, oh, well, I need you got to have Wi Fi, I need Wi Fi, or I need this, need this. You don't need anything outside of yourself to be happy. That's the biggest lesson that I learned from living with that tribe was there you absolutely do not need, you know, you don't need a cell phone, you don't need hardly any food <laughs> to be happy. You just everything that you need is inside of yourself. If I may ask, how on earth did this come about? How did you meet these folks? Well, that's so that's actually what I do for work is I find really wild experiences for people and I kind of make it happen. So for me, I was hired by a couple who wanted to go to Africa and have some really unique experiences. So I called my friend who lives in Africa and I said, you know, in a nutshell, hey, I'd like to, I need to get a hold of some tribesmen. So we got a hold of a Maasai tribesman, and then through his friend and his friend, we eventually got an experience with the Maasai, but also Hadza tribe and other tribesmen. We were able to get a connection with, with through him. We were to get a connection to the chief. The chief had to actually go to the local government and do a petition to get us to come to live with them because it's illegal to to actually go and stay with uncontacted tribes unless you get permission from their chief in writing. And so we had to get that permission from their chief, which took a long time. And they speak a click language as well. So we had to get a translator as if we could speak any African language. But the click language is very interesting to to listen to and to communicate with through our translator. But we got to ask them questions. We, we, we sat in a big semicircle around a fire and we asked questions back and forth you know, what do you love most about your tribe? And they would ask questions like, how many wives do you have? You know, it was, uh, it was a wild experience. Anything in particular surprised you the most? Hmm. I would say the level at which they were living, it's hard to explain, but I would say when someone doesn't have shelter, when someone is living under trees, and that is their protection from rain, that is their protection from sun, and they have nothing else. There's babies with the women and healthy babies and just realizing like they had nothing outside of themselves except for bow and arrows. And that's a very wild experience. That was the most surprising thing is, is seeing how little you need to live. It, I, I had no idea that human beings could live happily and contently with literally nothing except for a bow and arrow. It was absolutely mind-boggling to me. Yeah, mine's not it's extreme, but when I started backpacking, I had a similar thing. I was like, everything I need is on my back. Why do I have this house with all that stuff? Backpacking changed how I look at life for that very reason that you talk about. So Chase, you've done 80 of your original 100 on your bucket list. So what do you have coming up next? What's left to do? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm 80 out of 100 are done. And there are some things that are not even that terribly difficult. You know, for example, uh, I still haven't been fly fishing. Uh, I haven't learned how to play guitar. There, there's some that are I can absolutely get done within the next few months, just kind of on, on my spare time, if you will. And, and those things I, I'm passionate about. I really do want to learn those things. And I want to do those things. There's also some things that I will need to take time. You know, on the list is to build a tree house, uh, you know, on the list is to build my family, make my family tree. On the list is to coach my kids' team, to you know, own a Corvette, which is my favorite car in the world. There, there are some things that are definitely long term. Uh, this is, it, it really became a, I would say more than a hobby. I mean, this became my almost obsession to cross off my bucket list. And when I got to about 75 items about a year and a half ago, I really slowed down and I realized that my cup is full. My, my life is just so full and I have done so much and I really just started wanting to live for helping other people cross off their bucket list, create and cross off their bucket list. Um, so I started to do a lot of meetups and I, I have my blog, The Bucket List Lifestyle, and I started to write more and to really just focus on other people instead of on my own, because I had used used this as inspiration for others, but I hadn't actually taken an active role in helping people cross off their bucket list items. 
And so I started like, all right, well, I can go on these trips with people. And I started to actually take people on adventures. I see that you've got three right now. And I don't know when people are going to be listening to it. It could be 10 years from now. But at the time of this recording, you've got the Japan Cherry Blossoms and the Penis Festival. That sounds a little interesting. What's that all about? Yeah, it's so funny. You just brought that up. So I'm actually partnering with a really good friend of mine. His name is Scott Brills. He is an incredible adventurer. He's been doing he's been doing trips to Africa and Japan for a long time. He's a wild man, absolute wild man. He's done the marathon through the Gobi Desert with zero training where he just showed up and just I one of five people, uh, you know, bet just I could just tell story after story of this guy. And him and I are partnering together to do pretty much just the wildest Japan trip that we could think of. We we were like, you know what? What is like the funnest, wildest thing where if it was just you and I, what would we do? And so we're doing like sumo wrestling. We're doing, as in not just watching, we're going to do it. Uh, We're dressing up as Mario and Luigi and Princess Peach and Bowser. And we have these really fast little go-karts and we're going to go through the streets of Tokyo. All sorts. And the actual penis festival is going on while we're there, uh, which is where they make these giant paper mache and metal penises. And they parade them through the street. And it's a... it's basically their fertility festival, and it's just fun. You know, it started as more of an ancient fertility festival, and now it's more of just like a fun penis festival where it's almost like a bachelorette party. You know, everyone's got the little penis straws and things like that. Um, and, of course, the, the cherry blossoms. If, if you haven't heard of the J- Japanese cherry blossom festival, Google image search it because it is absolutely magnificent um and even all of the locals are just like it's their time of year where they they just love to to go to the cherry blossoms and sit underneath and have picnics there'll be hundreds of people just you know drinking a beer or some wine and and eating some strawberries and things like that and speaking of parties you also are going to rio for the carnival oh my gosh yeah uh carnival in rio is i'd say it's it's definitely one of the top parties on earth so one of the cool things that I've been able to do is as I've traveled, I've found what the best parties on earth are. I've been to every cultural festival on the planet, all the wonders of the world, a lot of like the big traditional places that people like to go. And I just said, okay, what are the funnest, craziest things that we can do? Uh, and I found the top 10 wildest, funnest, you know, and, and it's not always just wild and fun. We have things like Everest Base Camp. We have things that are more calm, but we have these fun things that I personally love to do. And, and one of them was Carnival in Rio because I just had such a fun time with the Brazilian people. They're so loving. They're so inviting. And, you know, I, I had people invite me into their home for dinner. Give me, you know, someone will just have an extra beer and they'll just be walking down the street. Hey, man, here, have a beer. You know, like it's just such a giving and loving community vibe that you get in Brazil. And, uh, and, and Carnival is, is definitely different than I thought it would be because I, I don't really know exactly what I had in my brain, but it's, it's, it, they're called blocos and they're block parties all over Rio de Janeiro, all over Brazil. But I was in Rio de Janeiro and they have the, the traditional, you know, where people are dressed up and they're super flashy with feathers and their you know, all the, these wild costumes is actually a parade that happens in a big stadium. You go to the stadium and then the parade happens and it's amazing and it's insane and ridiculous. And then you go back to the block parties and most of it is dressing up like Halloween. You know, people have all sorts of different costumes. You know, people will be a bumblebee or Superman and you're just dressed up in in wild Halloween costumes, basically drinking and dancing and listening to music and following big floats through the streets. But it's really fun. We're going to a ball this year which is really, it's a really fun gay ball actually there. One of my favorite things to do is I I love going to the, for example, at Oktoberfest, there is a gay tent and it's the funnest tent in all of Oktoberfest. They, They just have so much more fun in my experience than any of the other tents. And when I go to like the gay ball, they're having just so much fun and they're expressing themselves and dancing. And I, I'm, I'm personally not gay, but I, I do have a lot of gay friends because they're so fun. And I just, I love going. So we're going to go to an actual ball, like a dress up suit and tie and ball gown, kind of a ball, the gay ball in Rio. And it's, it's going to be fun. I'm really excited. Good. And let's talk about one last festival before we move on. How about in India, the Holy Festival? Oh, wow. So in India, a really cool thing is that what I found was there's not a lot of actual 
Western tours that are going to India. In fact, we're one of only two that takes people and both of them are really small group. You know, we only take seven people. This other group only takes six, I think, to this place called Vrindavan, which is it's where it all started. You know, Holi is the festival of the light winning over darkness. And it's their Krishna battled Holika, their devil, uh, and had won. And all this battle happened in, uh, in Vrindavan, which is a tiny, a small town and near Agra, which is where the Taj Mahal is. And so we go into this, this traditional small town and it's crazy. It's wild. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Holy Festival, imagine where they throw all of the wild colors up in the air. So if you haven't, if you haven't heard of Holy before, it's where they throw these, these powders, all these different powders and colors in the air and people are covered in powder and they'll throw it in your face and you got to wear sunglasses because it's definitely getting your eyes and you never know what, what kind of powder they're using in, in India. But people would just pile into these massive temples. And on, on stages, there would be these priests. And these priests would have these almost like Hawaiian lays, but with Indian flowers uh, around them. And, and there would be, I, I swear, this, it doesn't make sense exactly, but there was sparkles in the air. I don't know how that happened. I don't understand it. But it was like dust particles that were all sparkles in the air inside of these temples so you'd walk in and it'd be full of people like a thousand people in a room that only holds 300 and the whole air is just full of sparkles and the priests are in the front and you push your way to the front eventually you get we ended up having to just pay a local to help us get to the front because we're like there's no way that we're pushing through i had a group of 10 people uh total with my videographer and stuff so you know we got to the front and they gave us sweets they gave us little like uh little cookies uh and and gave us a blessing and it and gave us some flowers a lay for us and things like that and it was it's just fun you know india is a crazy place in the sense that you never know what you're about to get into you never know what you're about to see when you go around the corner uh and you can get into some pretty wild situations and i did it by myself first a holy festival on my own travels and then in taking people there it was like i'm glad that i take people there because it can get really I'd say, to be honest, it can get dangerous. India is a place where, uh, especially for, for women sometimes, they don't respect the bodies of women as much. So they will, they'll just like grab or touch and it's, it's not okay. And, and having uh, our own private security guards and stuff was super important. So anyone who goes to Holi, it is one of the most magnificent experiences in the world. And during a festival like that, to make sure that you have just, it's very inexpensive, just paying a local uh, to be your security guard or to go with a uh, with a group of people, it, I'd say that's really important. So, how does uh, tell us a little bit now about your company and so what is it that you do? Do you do the different things each year, or do you have like you do the things we talk about? You do those each year, or tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so like I was talking about how I, I did a lot of festivals and and really fun things, and so what I decided to do is I just took the the top ten funnest experiences of my life or most incredible experiences of my life. And I started taking people to those 10. And now we do those 10 adventures every single year. And it's just really small group. I, I personally got really, really annoyed with the tour industry. I don't like it. I don't even like calling my company a tour company. We're an adventure company because it was the itinerary, you stuck to the itinerary. I, I felt almost like cattle going through. You never know who you're going to be on this trip with. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to do things a little differently. I have, it's application only. So, you know, it's like I, I make sure I talk to each person individually on the phone, on a video chat before making sure everyone's positive and, and they understand the vibe we're going for. And uh, now I, I take those small groups to those fun places and I get to see the look on their face, that that awe when they see the Taj Mahal for the first time or the feeling where I, I'm watching seeing someone shake when they are running with the bulls in Spain, having an experience like that. So we have our, our public trips and then I, I do the private ones too, like the one in Africa you know, someone, uh, a man and his wife said, Hey, we want to do some wild stuff in Africa. Let's, uh, let's go. And we went together. It was a, a, a super small group, but the private trip was, uh, was really wild. We, we had a lot of experience. We climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. We, you know, went on the, we had to stay and glamping in the middle of the Serengeti with lions around our tent. It was, uh, a lot of really cool experiences. So I'm, I'm so lucky to, 
be able to do what I love and to be able to, to see the look on people's faces as they, they get to have the same experiences that I had and I get to create that space for them. And at the same time, it was literally just a one day decision where I was just like, eh, okay, like, let's just do this. And I had no idea how to run a business. I had no idea, especially an online business. And I've just taken it step by step every single day. I, I didn't really have a lot of money to start this or anything. As I said before, I was a caregiver and I had to quit my job as a caregiver to go and do the bucket list lifestyle. So just knowing that, you know, it's, although it sounds incredibly like flashy and like I have all my stuff together, that's not necessarily true. I, I'm just trying to follow my passion and to attract people with my love of travel and, and just taking it step by step. And, and, I, and I fail sometimes and then I pick myself back up and I, and I try again. Cool. So if people would like to read your blog or find out about your adventures or just kind of find out what you're up to, what's the best way for them to reach out to you or to find you? Yeah, thebucketlistlifestyle.com. That's the blog. Also, I'm sure you'll have a my name as well, Chase Beringer. Feel free to, uh, you can add me on Facebook or The Bucket List Lifestyle on Instagram. Social media is a great way because we're, we're just posting a bunch of fun stuff that uh, kind of keeps you excited about travel as well. And we, we teach a lot about like how to travel inexpensively. Our trips are super affordable because I never had a lot of money growing up and I never had a lot of money during my travels. So I didn't want to make it super expensive for people. So, and I also like, I don't really mind if someone doesn't travel with me. I just want someone to travel in general. So I teach people how to get free flights and, you know, absolutely for free. It's all on the website up there, learning how to get free hotels. I just want people to travel and to experience life fully. And whether that's through writing a bucket list and crossing them off one by one, or whether that's just from, you know, hey, I'm just going to do this one day or I, okay, I'm going to sell it all or the opposite where I'm going to keep my job and I'm just going to travel once every four months. That's great too. As long as people are seeing the world and experiencing their life in the way on their terms, the way they want to, I'm happy. That's what I want. Cool. And I'll put all of Chase's links on both the show notes. If you scroll down your phone or on the website, uh, so be on the lookout for those. And if you want to give a main takeaway for people today, what, what do you want them to, to take home and to chew on tonight? I would say a lot of it is about possibility. It's about looking at, uh, you know, maybe my life or someone else on, on a podcast and, and saying like, oh, well, that's, that's cool for him, but that's not my life because A, B, and C. I don't have the, the money. I wasn't raised this way. Whatever it is, I would say for you to just think about possibilities, I know it's a little cliche, are, are truly endless because, I mean, imagine me sitting there I'm 50 pounds overweight, I'm divorced, I'm depressed at 22, I'm contemplating suicide, and I made a transition from and living in a small town making not a lot of money at all, transitioning from that to where I am now, uh, it's, it's night and day, black and white. So just understand that you have no idea what life has in store for you right now. And I'm not saying that your your life may be in a dark place, I'm simply saying that it can go from where you are to where you have no idea where it could possibly go. It's so, so beautiful and incredible. So, so keep your mind open to possibility and understand that when, if you do write a bucket list, you're not writing it for the version of you. Now you're writing it for the version that you, of the person you could become. I just love this interview with Chase. And I hope that this show and particularly this episode opens your eyes to the possibilities of what you can do with your life. We get so caught up in our day-to-day -day ruts and all that, that I think it's important to, to step outside and look and see what on earth do you want to do with your life? You know, I, I'm a big proponent that adventure travel allows you to lead a bigger life because it pushes you outside of your comfort zones. And it's when you're outside your comfort zones is where you find your growth. That's where you build your self-esteem, get the confidence to tackle all the crazy things that happen in our lives. So anyway, so I hope you got a lot out of today's episode. If you head to the website, activetrialadventures.com, I'll have photos that Chase has taken, information on how to reach out to Chase if you wish, and some videos to show some of the crazy things that he's done. I don't necessarily advocate showing up to some of these places like uh, Chase's friend did to just run across the Gobi Desert. I believe in training and preparation for things such as that. I don't even necessarily advocate doing some of the crazy activities. But if that's on your bucket list, go for it. But be smart about it. And I hope that today's show encourages you 
to take some time for yourself to sit down and think of what do you want to do with the rest of your life? You know, we, you can't say, oh, someday I'm going to do this because someday, as I heard somewhere and I don't know who to credit, someday is not a day of the week. If you were to do something, you have to write it down, commit to it, and then think, what are the obstacles that are preventing you from doing that? And then figure out how to whack away at those obstacles so you can achieve your goals and dreams, whether it's to climb Kilimanjaro or to jump out of an airplane. If that's what you want to do, that's not on my bucket list, but I know it's on a lot of people's bucket list. And I like too that Chase says, not everything on the bucket list has to be expensive or time consuming. It could just be getting the dozen roses to his mom just for no good reason at all. So anyhow, I, I think that this was an interesting thought-provoking interview, and I hope you do take some time just to chew on it and perhaps listen to it again. And I would encourage you to share this episode in particular with your friends on Facebook, Instagram, and across your emails. Sharing and word of mouth is the best way to grow the podcast. I've seen a huge surge in the last month of downloads, so I can see that you are now sharing it and the word is getting out. So thanks for that. It means a lot to me. I think we've got some great things going on here and I look forward to sharing more adventures with you. And speaking of sharing, how about sharing with me what your bucket list items are? I'd love to hear what your top three are. Just reach out to me via email at kit at activetraveladventures.com or via social. My social channels are on the website and in the show notes for today's episode. I'm back from PodFest. I do apologize for a little mix up with the double, double posting of the Australia episode. Sorry about that. I did get a ton out of that conference and and I'm looking forward to implementing some of the techniques I learned to make this a better show for you. A special shout out to Kara who first emailed me and then we got on the phone and had a nice conversation. She and her girlfriends are going to do the Cotswold Way because of this program. They listened to it, learned about it, and now they've set sights on doing the Cotswold Way. I'm hoping to get them on the program to hear how they liked it. It should be a lot of fun. I will be back in two weeks. We are going to Canada to Banff National Park, which is stunning, stunning, stunning. So I've I've got a guy coming on the show that's been there multiple times to give us the insights that we need to know in order to plan that trip. So until then, this is Kit Parks. I'll be back in two weeks. Adventure on. Adventure on.